have you have you lived in New York all your life? Yes, I have. Um, I left for college, and I've I've been on tour a lot over the past decade. Uh, but I have lived in New York my whole life. I'm really a lifer. That's where I've always been based. Is New York quite a fruitful place for a lot of the, I guess, idiosyncratic maybe characters that we hear on the record? Uh, yeah, yeah. There, some of those characters I met in California. Um, some of them are friends. Some of them are, you know, complete strangers. Uh, some of them are in Norway. It All the characters that you meet on this record are from a very specific period in my life. It was about a month, a month or two long in between two tours, which were, was the, the canceled Purple Mountains tour and a tour that I had booked with Craig Finn doing an opening set for him. And in that time, I, I, re I remember I was opening for my friend Lola Kirk in Brooklyn and I had, they literally gave me a 15 minute time slot, which was so funny. I thought I was like, wow. 15 minutes and I was getting paid an X amount. And I, I remember calculating like how much I was making per minute. <laughs> um, but I got up there and I just could not play my old songs because so much had changed in my life in such a drastic and immediate way. So it was after that, that show, I, I just, I was like the only way I can go on tour right now is if I write an entirely new catalog to play and so I did, and that's what we recorded. And then I remember taking those songs on tour and just trying to figure out how to play them every night before I would go on and be like, okay, I think I can play this one tonight, you know. Were you aware of how much things had changed prior to that moment, or was that the kind of catalyst for that realization? Um, no, it was like, as I was trying to gear up for that show, I ended up doing this, I mean, I do this a lot where if I feel sort of fed up with the music that I'm playing, I'll like, I ended up writing this. It, it was almost like a stand up set. I mean, and at one point it, it involved an exercise routine and I had like everyone doing jumping jacks with me and it felt <laughs> sort of, it was really fun. And I realized like I could kind of get the audience to do anything with me at that point. And so I did sort of a, um, what do you call it? Just, a mambo line around the venue and Lola said, what are you doing? And uh, I have this music <laughs> blasting behind me that I had, I had triggered just with my phone. And I was like, I don't know, I'm going through a crisis, get in line. <laughs> and, um, it was at that moment, you know, that I was like, yeah, this, I, I can't do this opening for Craig Fit on tour. <laughs> it's fine to do it at like a, a hometown Brooklyn show with one of my really good friends, but you know, for my 15 minute time slot. But I think I was like, yeah, I, I think this is fun, but I, I need to actually write something that I can present every night. Maybe it should be like music. <laughs> Would have been a, an intriguing approach to that support slot. Well, you know, I ended up doing stuff like that. I was trying to remember that tour is kind of a blur. I mean, it was a little while ago, but I ended up doing this thing where, how did I even set it up? I did end up like high-fiving everyone in the audience at the very end of my set and like walking through the crowd and leaving my my guitar kind of like a, a drone going. So I, I always do stuff like that if I can get away with it. There were some venues where it just felt really awkward and I didn't want to put that energy into the room, but I, I have a tendency to break outside of that mold because I get really, I think I get just too stiff inside of the like get up and play your songs every night thing. So I need there to be some element that's kind of weird and that breaks up that routine of someone going to a show and having their drink, hearing the songs, clapping at the end of each song. You know, like I, I think- It I becomes get, very routine. It does, and, and if I can have one thing that I can do every night that really changes with all of the surroundings, um, I think that makes me really, makes me tick, and it kind of keeps me on my toes. So yeah, I did end up doing, I have to look back and remember like how I even framed that whole kind of bit that I was doing, um, but it was, it was something. Yeah, so we'll see. Every It's always something different. <laughs> <laughs> is that desire 
to express yourself in different ways, partly coming from the fact that, you know, music isn't the only art form that you kind of are very involved with, because you're a visual artist as well, right? I am a visual artist. Um, I did a lot of performance art in college, and I think a lot of my idols blend performance with music. And yeah, I, I think I was introduced to a lot of work and artists when I was in school that really made me want to do something slightly slightly different. You know, whether it was Yoko Ono or Laurie Anderson, Miranda July, um, Chris Burden, like a lot of, you know, John Cage, like who, you name it. I think I've always been really interested in those people, but I also came from a very traditional music background in a way. Traditional in some senses, like, you know, get up and play songs, kind of traditional. But I've always felt like that wasn't coming from a totally honest place because the stuff I'm interested in is really different from that. So I, it's always been, there's always been sort of tension for me around how to get up on stage every night and play songs. And I'm sort of always doing it a little bit differently. So it's like the desire to perform and the desire to write songs, are they coming from quite different places almost? I think that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, it's interesting. This record was almost out of necessity because I had this job that I had to do that I was already kind of signed up for. So I was like, okay, I'm going on a indie rock music tour. So I'm going to write some songs for that, you know. But I think had I been asked, had I had that same, you know, two or three weeks booked at an art gallery, I probably would have made something entirely different. It really, that's really the extent of the thought I put into what I was going to do when I went into the studio. Um, I definitely did not think any further than that tour. I didn't really think about releasing it or how it might get received. I mean, it's a pretty personal record in a lot of ways. There's a lot of name checking, you know, I'm like really writing down specific people's names. Um, and th that that's sort of a funny thing to put out into the world. It's almost diaristic. So yeah, I just wasn't really thinking about that. But now that it's going out there and I'm getting some really wonderful feedback from total strangers about how much they're relating to this one song that I put out that it, you know, it talks about very specific people in very specific places, but somehow it's resonating with people and that that's really been a joy to experience. I feel really grateful. Was that Hard Drive, the song you yeah, were just Yeah, you know, I just put it out not even a week ago and I, I've gotten so many nice messages from strangers saying things like, it was hard for me to get out of bed today, but this song helped me do that. And I'm counting along with you at the end of the song. And just those kinds of messages, like thinking that that song helped people get out of bed in the morning actually really makes me feel so, um, so good when I'm, especially when we're all so isolated. It's like, I really feel connected to people in this bizarre way. How did you get talking to the security guard at the beginning of that song? Um, she started talking to me. I was there with two friends and I, this happens to me sometimes when I'm in a certain place in my life. I think like I, a lot of strangers feel compelled to talk to me a lot. Sometimes that's great. Sometimes it can be really overwhelming. I, I can be pretty shy, but in this case, I was just at this exhibit and she saw me looking at this one piece and we were just in this enough of a close proximity to one another that she said, hey, you know, I'd really love to give you an overview on, on, the, on the exhibit. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. It, it's not usually the role of a security guard to do that. And I, I was intrigued by that because usually they're like almost like statues and they're not expected to or probably you know, there's a certain code of conduct, I think, and a formality to the role of someone playing security and keeping the place secure. <laughs> and I felt like she sort of broke down that role a little bit and sort of got, oops, sorry, that was my, my USB speaker. I was listening to music. Um, so she, she sort of broke down that that wall and became a tour guide, but it was not an official tour. It was her personal views on art, on feminism, on politics, on spirituality. And it just, it was 
this happened to me a lot in this particular moment in my life with with that happened with the guy at the end of the seventh ray too um it was almost like a spiritual filibustering or something but it not so i mean it was really pleasant the guy at the end of the seventh ray was much more intense but she just talked to me for about 10 minutes um it was this sort of monologue about everything she was thinking about and i i thought at once it was i couldn't really pull myself away because she had already engaged me i found a lot of what she was saying to be really interesting and just she had these very clear opinions about things that uh, it just struck me. I was like, I, I don't know what brought us together in that moment. And so she she just sat there with me and my two friends and told us about the art that was surrounding us, but more really about her, I think. So I love that too, when people present an opinion as though it's going to reflect something about the thing that they're talking about, but really it's it's really reflecting so much about them and their their spirit and the way that they think. And when you open that door, sometimes you just end up in these really unexpected places with people. Uh, I mean, you kind of like turn that key and I can, I'm intrigued by that. It's interesting what you say there as well, that almost, it's almost like most of what we see in art is like self-projection. Oh yeah, for sure. Definitely. There's, there's a huge element of that in what she was doing. Um, but I love that she presented it as, let me give you an overview on this. It's like, let me give you this objective, almost clinical synopsis of what you're seeing in front of you. She didn't present it as, let me tell you my deepest thoughts about feminism and, and about the role of art in our lives. Uh, she presented it as an overview, which was a complete false advertising in this really delightful way. And I think that I, that's sort of why I like, I ended up going to that song and titling the record that because it's, of course, there's nothing about what I'm presenting to you as an overview on anything. It's like, let me take you on this um, diaristic ride through my life in this moment. It's just completely, completely from my perspective and... It's, there's nothing um, objective about it. So I like that. Why do you think it is that people quite often come up and speak to you? Like the way you were saying that people often begin conversations yeah. with you instead of the other way I around. I don't know. <laughs> that happened to me. I was remembering that happened to me in Mexico too. I was there just shortly uh, before the pandemic started. Diego Rivera has this incredible collection of pre-Columbian art. It's in Mexico City, and this guy just, in Spanish, I, I barely speak a lick of Spanish, just was following me around and, and pointing at things and saying, really, like, speaking really quickly in Spanish, knowing that I couldn't really understand him, just pointing at all these beautiful sculptures and telling me about them, and I could kind of pick out a couple words, but I sort of like nod and say, yeah, okay, thanks. I, I just kept saying, like, gracias. <laughs> Like, <laughs> um, so it happens to me a lot in art museums. I I don't know. I think I I somehow it's not always a good thing. Like I have a tendency to attract a lot of. I think I just have a very open and maybe approachable energy, for lack of a better word, which has sometimes led me to meet more nefarious characters. I, I think I just I I just have this very open open energy that people just see me as someone that isn't going to judge them which I think might I hope is true I think I try to be I mean we're, we're all judgmental um to a certain extent and I'm I definitely am trying to become a, more aware of when I am being judgmental but I think in general like I have a pretty open mind to what people have to say I think I have this curiosity too from sort of like a writer's perspective of experiencing other people's worldviews, um, even if they're very, very different from mine and like kind of getting into their worlds. And so, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious. And I, I think I have this a sort of vulnerability to me too. And I think that's the part that is sort of bittersweet is like, I think that can lead to a lot of really magical conversations with strangers. And it can also just lead to people being, um, definitely stepping over stepping over the line sometimes I'm also that person that everyone always asks me for directions even if I'm in a foreign country 
And that's, <laughs> I always, I'm always very flattered by that. I'm like, wow, I, I guess I know, like, I look like someone who knows where they're going. <laughs> uh, that's great, because I really don't <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Unless I'm in New York, and then of course I'm very happy to give directions. There, there was another character I wanted to ask about. He maybe kind of fits into what we've been speaking about, but I don't think he's on the record. Richard Jasmine. Oh my gosh, Richard Jasmine. He's on my last <laughs> record. Oh God. I mean, there's a good example of someone who, you know, once you open up to him, he he really stuck with you. <laughs> Um, I worked at the farmer's market in my neighborhood for many, many years uh, selling organic produce. And every Sunday, Richard Jasmine, who at the time was 90 years old and, and up, is, this was probably went on for about three years, would visit me and propose to me every Sunday. <laughs> Sometimes bringing gifts, including half-eaten croissants from Zabar's, a box of chocolates with one chocolate missing. Um, sometimes like uh, like a half a ham sandwich. Uh, you know, just like funny little... <laughs> he came bearing these snacks that were <laughs> not very appetizing. <laughs> um, and he would talk to me about the opera, and he would talk to me about... He, he loved this one movie that starred... Was Nixon? He was an actor, right? Uh, not Nixon. It was the other one. Reagan. Um, Reagan, yeah. yeah. sorry. <laughs> I haven't seen this film. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, he would talk to me about this one film that he starred in with this character named Cassandra. And, and at one point, he broke his shoulder, and I made the mistake of, of giving him my number and saying, you know, if you need anything, you can call me. And then he started calling me all the time and leaving me voicemails. And I thought, you know, he, he was kind of a kind of a mensch but uh, but and like a little annoying but also v- harmless and and so kind at the end of the day um and of course it's this 90 year old man he he had a, he wore this yellow sweater that had he had masking tape on the collar to keep it together and he would ride over on his bicycle he definitely too like he lived in in a you know a fancy high rise too it's just a very strange character very charismatic. He would talk to everyone. Um, and then you know, he would be absolutely unaware of the line that was building behind him of all the people trying to buy produce while he was trying to propose to me. Um, anyway, I gave him my, my number at that point, and I did end up giving him some herbs while his shoulder was broken. He had fallen off his bicycle, and he left me all these voicemails, and every time I would get one, I thought, oh God, he's called again. Like, (laughs) when is he going to give up this act? And then I started saving them. And he would say some occasionally really beautiful things. Um, Because I think we developed this rapport where I never responded. So it was almost like he would leave me these messages as if I would never hear them or something. But he was always talking to me. And so there you have that same kind of energy of, of like, He's talking to me, but he's really maybe talking to himself. The voicemail on the record was the last voicemail that I got from him. On my last record, rather. Um, And I never saw him again, and I think he had passed away. And I I haven't had the courage to go to the building to ask the doorman, and it's been several years now. But so I just accept that that he's gone. But, um, you know, I think... I was this character at the market. I was a character for other people too. I was people called me like lettuce girl. I would always hear little kids walk by and say lettuce girl. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I was this lettuce girl on the weekends who uh, at you know, at night was playing shows and so people would talk to me about my music and I think he was one of them and um it was just this very sort of provincial uh relationship and I look back on it very fondly, and I miss I miss working at the market. I couldn't do the late nights, early mornings anymore. It's interesting to get a window into someone's life in that way, where you're seeing them at their kind of point of completion. If that makes sense, that they've kind of amassed all this wisdom and experience, and this is the kind of completely distilled version yeah. of them in a yeah. working way. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's pretty beautiful. It's similar as well on the record in the way that he, you know, would 
he was very tied to that specific part of your life working at the market. It's, it's similar on the record in the same way that the voices kind of float in and out and they become characters and they kind of drift in and we hear them for a bit and then they they slip away again and slip out of the mix. Did that part of the record change quite a lot for you in terms of where they rested in it and how long they spoke for and the music that was accompanying them? Or was it always very set in stone and you knew what pieces you were going to kind of slot into the mix? No, I just, at that time when I was making, you know, and the, the Richard Jasmine pieces from my record Play Till You Win, um, and so it, it kind of felt like when I finished that record, I had that audio clip and then I had a song called Haley that he followed. And then on this record, the overview record, I wanted to fall, write another Haley song spelled differently about a different Haley and then also have another song. with. I like to have some continuity between records. So I thought it just made sense too when I was writing that song, when I was writing Hard Drive. I remembered, oh, you know, I actually have a voice memo of her I wonder if it, if you can even make it out. Because I, I really, I, I record these things never intending to use them. I just record them for myself. I was just, I was recording everything at that time. I was feeling very unmoored. And I think it sort of grounded me to be writing things down, recording. And yeah, I guess it was just an intuitive decision. She seemed like she fit in there. A lot of that song is sort of found. It's almost like found objects pulled from different moments in my life and and those were things that I had written down in my phone in my notebook um in the voice memo and they all sort of got pieced together at a certain point so it it to have something concrete like a voice recording felt appropriate it was very found feeling to me and similarly the drum beat in that song is actually pulled from Josh Kaufman who produced the record who helped me bring all these songs into manifest them into songs um, from just words he pulled the drum beat off of his Instagram feed Eric Biondo uh, sometimes posts these loops of him playing and he, he liked it and it had just come up that day so he plugged it into his computer and the whole song just felt very kind of like like a collection of things that we wove together so it really fit there so when it came to the producing process, it was almost like you went in with all, like you said, the, the kind of parts and the production process was just assembling them and piecing them together. I walked in with only words. I, I didn't have any music. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had um, the song Michelangelo, like I had written, that was, that one was, I had a melody and I had chords for that. Otherwise it was mostly just just words yeah we made all the music in that week uh and that was just me and josh and then whoever we felt like bringing in and whoever was around like i think jt bates happened to be in town that week and we pulled him into the studio and um stuart bogey was around um josh's wife annie is an incredible bassist and uh took off work one morning to come in you know so it's interesting that michelangelo was the one that you had the kind of structure there for because it doesn't really have a chorus no, does it? No, I never wrote a chorus for it and I had played it for some friends and everyone was like yeah you should probably write a chorus um, and I it felt so forced to arrive at any kind of conclusion for that song because it's it's really a song about feeling very incomplete <laughs> which you know it's a little bit on the nose I didn't really do it on purpose it just I could never get it to go there I tried and it always just felt like it subtracted so it just ended up being that loop that it is and and having a guitar solo instead of a instead of a chorus I guess I just liked the melody I liked singing it it was hard to to derivate from that form for some reason was it almost a testament as well to like the fluidity of the recording process and the fact that it was quite free in a way and anything could kind of happen when you, you're going in with the songs in that kind of shape. Yeah, and a lot of the, those things, you know, the the last I made, the one with Richard Jasmine, and, and I mean, I walked into the studio completely prepared. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I had, I really 
felt a lot of pressure to make the most of my time and the people that were on it and 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 their time and and this one was completely different i just i didn't have it in me to have that very fine-tuned attention to detail that was ultimately kind of draining i just didn't have it in me that time so it was way more about you know josh would play some chords out on the piano. He's like, maybe we can build like a bridge out of this. And then whatever he had played ended up being the bridge. And it surprisingly would land back at the verse in in a way that somehow worked. And I think that can happen with music. You're not exactly sure why it works. And then you kind of think about it and you look at sort of some of the theory and you're like, oh, here's why it, it works. I just didn't mean for that to happen necessarily. I think it was a very freeing process just to go in and have this trust that we would find something. And and usually you can build a lot out of um, just a few, a few little pieces. A lot of this record as well is about almost reconnecting with nature. When you're going into that process, are you almost able to slip into more natural rhythms or melodies? Are you kind of able to almost tap into something innate when you don't have any kind of pre-proposed idea mm-hmm. of what you want to do with it musically? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just, that's a good question. I guess, I think there's something really beautiful about a melody that you've been working on for a long time and you chip away at it and it just is kind of perfect. And yeah, like sometimes beautiful melodies are, are like sculptures in that way, but then there occasionally you can have, I think, or I can have moments where it is more intuitive and just comes very quickly and you find a certain momentum and a certain clip to working and you just have to follow that and when I'm working with someone else I I do look for sort of a quickness um, before it sort of loses steam and actually hard drive didn't end up having any melody because it was spoken because I had started I was just looking for a pulse to the lyrics to the song and the easiest way for me to do that was to not think about melody for a minute and just find a rhythm and how it how the phrasing sort of fit into a certain chord structure and then uh I tried to put a melody to it and it again similarly it just didn't feel it felt very forced so I was like well I guess that this is this is how it's going to be and you sort of listen I listened to the song versus trying to bring it to a different place. I just sort of listened, had had arrived sort of naturally um, and didn't really question it. And just very, very different from how I've worked in the past. I, I, I Again, like I, you saw me fiddle with my sound at the beginning of of our conversation. Like I, I really am a perfectionist and it's it's it can be a really terrific asset, uh, but it can also be a real curse and, and the source of so much anxiety. And I just, I again, I, I was battling so much in that moment when we were recording that I just didn't have the energy to have that kind of anxious attachment to perfection. So it had to be, it had to be something different, which is, I don't think I'll make anything like that again. It'll be something different next time. Do you feel like that vulnerability you were experiencing during the recording process kind of manifest itself. Yeah, in the I think so. Um, I didn't mean for it to, but I was, I had a flu at the time. I was quite depressed. Um, I was also taking care of my friend who was very sick and, and just the studio became a bit of a sanctuary for me, but it was, I was still pretty just beat up in general feeling very exhausted and and um and drained you're hearing like kind of my reserves we're tapping into the reserves there is sort of a rawness to that i think that comes through you can hear it in michelangelo there's a couple places where you can hear it in my voice it's not the syrupy sweet thing that i was going for on my last record of like really trying to get a perfect tone it's like actually kind of gravelly and sounds a little worn out and I guess there's something there's something on hard drive that I think people are responding to, and similarly, just I think I just had to, you know, come as I was in that moment. In a way, that's a tremendous gift to myself now because 
I don't have to strain to try to sing something that's like in a key that's hard for me because I wanted it to be in that key. And I don't have to put on a different face to get on stage and sing something that's about feeling a little bit beat up around the edges and and uh, feeling confused about about things or where I'm going, you know, because that's that's what these songs are. So it's it's actually now in this moment like a it's just these are songs that I can sing because I can I can actually sit inside of them quite comfortably. It's interesting at the start of that you mentioned the studio it became a sanctuary for you as a result of all the other things that were going on in your life at that time. Sanctuary is a word for me that almost feels synonymous with the ramble mm. as well and what you're kind of building there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was the last song that I did. Gosh, yeah. I mean, the Ramble is a sanctuary for me. It's this place in Central Park where when COVID sort of first hit the U.S., and obviously that was a very difficult thing to be processing, and New York was at that point the epicenter of the world. And there I was just trying to survive that. And for some reason, I... A lot of people didn't feel safe going outside, but I felt safe going to Central Park. And so I would I was waking up really early at that time, like at 5 a.m. I would just get up and go to the Ramble and go kind of early season bird watching and just walk for hours. And there there were hardly any people there, so it's very quiet. It was sort of eerie and it was just feeling like birds were sort of taking over and and human existence was really quieting. And, you know, in this this really eerie way, there were a lot of people dying. So that I was definitely feeling that, that like lack of lack of human presence and, and that sort of I don't know, a little bit of a cloud over over Central Park. I, as it's very close to one of the hospitals that was treating a lot of patients as well. So that specific part of the ramble that of Central Park called the Ramble became a place where I would go and find sort of sanctuary and and really just try to turn my gaze towards birds mostly, um, definitely towards spring sort of starting to emerge. But I've noticed that the more I can observe my natural surroundings, the more my mind can in that place when I'm not actually there. Um, the more I'm dreaming about it, the more... I just, I just sort of would throw myself into that atmosphere to try to, um, it wasn't really necessarily an escape so much as, yeah, so much as a sanctuary, a place to rest. And yeah, I, yeah, the Ramble is the place I could talk about a lot. It's, it's, it's a really interesting, interesting place. So were all the sounds on that song recorded in the Ramble, the actual physical space itself, or the, sorry, the, the natural samples? The yeah, songs, they are, um... My initial plan for that song, so I'm really obsessed with this artist named Janet Cardiff, and she actually, she has an audio guide to this certain part of Central Park, and I've gone on that guide many times where she, you follow her footsteps and she takes you on this kind of diaristic journey that that also collages history and music, and I was thinking about her a lot. I was thinking, okay, I, I would love to make one of those I'd love to record a guide um I actually did I recorded a spoken audio guide with the intention of you know you go to New York City and you put yourself in the place where you know the guide begins and then you just follow my footsteps and I take you around the ramble and in the end I just decided to take that out and let it be a self-guided tour I realize, okay, this is a record. This is <laughs> this is something that you know someone in the UK is going to hear, and I, I think it would actually be more enjoyable if I can take them to this place and they can have their own experience of walking through the ramble with me. And maybe there's a saxophonist there, <laughs> um, and there usually is. There's a couple saxophonists actually, <laughs> and they're they're they don't play quite as beautifully as Doug Weaselman who plays on the on the record but you know they are these almost like these um 
living monuments. They're, they're so dependable. They're really there like every, every weekend. And yeah, I was thinking also a lot about this video piece that I really like, um, that has a lot of that found sound. So, but then the lot of all the instruments were, I was actually quite, again, I was having a lot of health issues at the time when I was making that and struggling to actually record at that moment. So I wrote to some of my friends, I said, Hey, you know, Hey Ben, Ben Saraton plays, uh, he, he played some roads and, and some harmonium, I think, um, I said, hey, Ben, can, is there anything you want to add to this? Do whatever you want. I'll mix it all later. Just enjoy it and do it quickly. Don't let this take up a lot of your time. And I wrote to Michael Coleman and Aaron Roche and, of course, Josh Kaufman with the same direction. I love I loved giving directions like that and seeing what you end up with or directives, rather, I guess is the better word. I, I definitely experimented with that a lot live for a little while where I was either part of an ensemble or or uh, at the behind the wheel of an ensemble where you have a set of directives but everyone's improvising and I really missed that at that moment especially because I really missed playing live music and feeling the musicians around me and kind of playing off of each other so this is in no way a substitute but it was I think that's where the impulse came from to have other people play on it it's fascinating as well what you were saying, you know, about how it's a place that you can go to to like reconnect with your natural surroundings. Yeah, in New York City. <laughs> because I was reading as well that you were, I think maybe seven or eight, and you wrote a play called The Witch of Doom Castle. Oh my God, where did you read that? <laughs> I can't remember, but there seems to be a really fascinating parallel there because isn't that play about you know a woman grows mis- becomes like misunderstood by society and then has to reconnect with her natural surroundings <laughs> which is now something that seems to have kind of happened 30 years down the line oh my god i've thought about that and you're absolutely right i thought i've really i'm actually so i'm at my grandmother's old house right now and i can go find the playbill wow that and i did this a lot i was the oldest of a, a whole bunch of uh, my my sister my brother and my cousins um and I would write plays and we would put them on and we would charge $2 to come and all of our parents would pay us to come see our plays. <laughs> That's a good um, idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was usually directing and writing and yeah, the Witch of Doom Castle. Yeah, I, I God, I mean, as a young child, I think I was definitely trying to figure out my role uh, with all of that but you kind of already hit the nail on the head in terms of what how that manifests i mean are you a therapist on the side uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> there's someone a little bit clairvoyant about that yeah it's funny i think that impulse is not 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 left to me and, and there's also i'm i'm reading this book right now called cassandra speaks it's written by the woman who runs the Omega Center, which is sort of a, a a wellness center, I guess, in upstate New York. And she talks a lot about the the myth of Cassandra. And of course, this is a myth that I've known about for a long time. And, and similarly... I'm unfamiliar with this myth. What, oh. what exactly is the, the kind of outline of it? Well, I'm, I'm going to out myself right now, too, because I was going to say, I'll, when I meet strangers, sometimes they, they find out my name... They say, "Oh, like, like Cassandra, the uh, the Greek princess," and I'm like, "Yep, that's the one." <laughs> and then they go, "I'm always like, what version of the story do you know?" And then I inevitably get a different version every single time. Which, of course, you end up getting to know more about the person and the way that they tell the story because there is this kind of through line of this this Greek myth. Uh, but basically, she was a Greek princess who was courted by Apollo, who was in love with her. And this is one story. There are a few other versions, but this is the one that I, I kind of feel the is the, my version. Um, the definitive version. Yeah. The director's cut. Fall- yeah, yeah. From, coming from the uh, uh, Cassandra herself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> She he falls in love with her. He gives her the gift of clairvoyance. And when she 
doesn't want to, basically when she doesn't want to sleep with him, he gets really upset and has a fit and then spits in her mouth, which is um, a curse by, by which he allows her to keep her clairvoyance. However, no one will believe her. And so here you have this clairvoyant princess. She's she's really beautiful and well respected, and and then suddenly this curse is put on her, where she is starts predicting things and and talking to people about them, especially catastrophe, and no one believes her. So she ends up sort of going going mad because she predicts things like the Trojan War and other catastrophes, and unfortunately is driven mad by the fact that she has this gift, but no one will accept it. And, you know, there's this, I don't need to go too deep into this at the moment, but I, I have thought about that a lot. I think when we think about that myth, we can also think about how a lot of women I think feel and have felt for a long time in terms of having their voices be heard. And I I think Similar to what the security guard is saying at at the Met Breuer, we really need women's voices uh, in the balance. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue to be off balance. And and I think Cassandra's myth is a, a good reminder of that. Um, but it is, of course, very tragic. And so you have this what this psychology term which is called the Cassandra complex, which is that you feel like no one believes you, even though you're seeing a sort of like element of truth around you um, and, and sort of how that can be sort of maddening. That's the Cassandra complex. Yeah. You would imagine that could lead to like schizophrenia and stuff. We're you there, the idea yeah. of the Cassandra complex. Yeah, the, yeah. Like the hysterical women, woman, that, that sort of trope, um, which I think is another, like another trope that I think we need to sort of, let go of um but as long as women women's voices are not heard i think that trope will continue to exist unfortunately yeah were you always going to be called cassandra my mom's name is sandra okay and i was named after her and it was like kind of like a junior but at the beginning of my name i guess uh and she there was a moment where she, I think she always wanted to be Cassandra. That she felt like she had sort of gotten there, but not made it quite all the way to that name or something. And so, yeah, that was always going to be my name, I think. And you were born on Friday the 13th on a full moon. Yes, I was. And you have a slightly clairvoyant edge based on plays you've written at eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, based on, uh, you know, some of my magnum opus. Um do you still read Tarot? I do, yeah, I do. I There was a minute where I, I had to stop reading because I was, I got very sick. Um, and I really think that I I have to kind of work on energetic boundaries because I, I like really, I was working with a lot of people that were dealing with a lot of addiction and um, heartache and just like very difficult things. And I really have a very empathetic disposition and I really feel things deeply, especially with other people. And I really sometimes will feel things for other people, I think. And that's something I have to really work on. Um, So I have been a little bit more careful about reading for other people because I have to sort of guard my my resources a little bit right now and until I develop a better, you know, I think anyone who works with people, like whether you're, you know, a doctor or a hairdresser or, you know, or someone who does podcasts. Like, I think you have to sort of like develop a a way to protect that part of yourself. Yeah. It can be very hard to like what you're saying there, what you're feeling in that session for it to not bleed into your wider life and kind of have quite a deeply profound impact upon it. Yeah. I mean, people who are working in therapy or social work have, they learn techniques for how to do that these aren't techniques that we learn in daily life, you know, so we all have our own way of doing it sort of in, intuitively. Um, but it's, uh, it's something I haven't quite mastered yet. 
would you kind of consider yourself quite a spiritual person, kind of following on from what we've just been speaking about? I consider myself to be someone who is always very curious and investigating that side of life to varying degrees. And I think my position at this point is that I feel like I have a lot, a lot to learn. Um, and a lot of the things that I've experienced in my life thus far are just pushing me to get closer to <laughs> a, a certain humility that um, allows us to exist in, in a more spiritual realm. Um, I, I That's a hard question to answer, honestly. I. I don't know how to answer that question. I, I think I I study I study Buddhism. Like that's that's something I'm really interested in. Um and but there's something about it I wouldn't I just doesn't feel like necessarily spiritual, but um actually just way more practical than that. Way more grounded in in the earth and in nature. Does that kind of tie into a little bit what you sing about on New Bikini, I think, you know, when you're speaking about the water kind of being this healing thing. Similar to some of the other songs, I'm just letting people talk to me and tell me their views with their best intentions. And also kind of saying, you know, someone said, if you see someone that's blue and you say, you know, like, hey, you should try this. It's very easy to kind of shove that off or no, what's the expression? I don't know. It's just very easy to be like, yeah, maybe that works for you, but it doesn't work for me. And I think there's a little bit of that in this song, I hope. Um, but there's also a, a genuine belief that there's a, a certain healing power in just engaging with the ocean in a certain way. Uh, but there's also this sort of skepticism there that's when, you know, my friend says, hey, get in the water when I'm out in Norway. It cures everything. I'm like, well, it might make me feel better, but it it won't bring someone back from the dead. And that's sort of the place that, at a certain point in grieving, in the grieving process or the healing process, there's a lot of frustration, and you have to accept that. But similar, like my mom says, hey, go on that trip that you want to go on, like go get in the ocean and like, well, you know, it won't change this, 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 this genetic mutation. Uh, you can't change your, your DNA necessarily. I mean, maybe maybe we're figuring out ways to do that. Um, I know that the new vaccine, for example, like is going to your RNA. Um, but you know, there there are certain things that are are pretty much set in stone. And I'm I'm kind of saying, well, I can't I can't change my DNA, mom. But she's like. But she's saying, go ahead, go, just go to the ocean. And, and similar, like my friend's really sick and we, I, we probably can't fix it by going to the beach, but there's actually a lot of power in, in soothing certain aspects of the mind and, and ways that we can do that just by accessing nature. <laughs> I know that sounds super basic, but I'm experiencing that a lot right now. Like, I'm actually taking mineral baths every night, and I'm finding it's, like, really helping with um, certain health issues that I'm having. And, and I really did find that when I jumped into the ocean every day, it sort of, like, gave me this shock to my nervous system. Um, when I was in Norway, I, I got in the ocean every single morning, and it was freezing cold. And, you know, there's a lot of – there are also a lot of studies. Like, if you go – to Reykjavik and, and spend time with people there. There's just all of the, the local pools that you can go to or you, you go into all the different warm water and cool water and that's just a big part of the culture there and I find it's it is really invigorating. Yeah. I mean statistically people who live beside the ocean live longer, I think. I believe. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Is that what you were just saying there? Is that where the line about the mind-body connection comes from as well? Yeah, you know, th I think people who deal with a lot of um, gut issues are we're, we're learning a lot about the gut and how there are a lot of different mind techniques, like people who have cured things like Crohn's disease just through meditation. Of course, that's not everyone, um, but there, there are a lot of studies showing that you can actually buy 
repairing the connection between the mind and the gut, like you can repair a lot of really, really difficult chronic illnesses. But of course, of course, that's uh, not the full story. Um, but, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is that Western medicine does often try to see symptoms and repair them with medications. And sometimes those work great. I mean, antibiotics, for example, have saved many, many lives. Um, from my standpoint, Western medicine really is kind of the alternative medicine to what we've had all along, um, which is a lot of natural natural remedies and things. I mean, this is a whole other conversation. There's a whole other other, other um, podcast. But. It does interest me about mental health, though, how we almost try and treat it like a sprained ankle. Like, yeah, when you're given medication, it doesn't seem, it seems like a very kind of one-sided look at it and not really trying to in take in the whole picture, if that makes sense, of what's causing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's very complex. And I think we we really need to look at mental health with the same um, importance as everything else. Uh, I hope that there will be more of an emphasis on mental health as we move forward. Mental health is so incredibly important and we, we don't learn about it in school. I think my doctors have only started asking me things like, like, uh, did you ever experience trauma as a kid? You know, whereas that's not something that I think they asked even five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, and those kinds of things are coming up in a way it's, it's, I think there's a sort of paradigm shift happening with it. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of things, there are ways that we can treat mental health oh, without medication with a lot of lifestyle choices and everything too, but it, it, it really depends on the case. And medication can be very helpful for some people. We can also become resistant to medication, um, in some, some really extreme cases. You know, it's, it's absolutely a case-by-case -case basis. It's very complex. Yeah. I mean, it comes back to what you were saying earlier in regards to the water and the kind of attitude that, you know, it might work for you, but it won't work for me. It's the same thing where we're also specific as individuals that what's going to work for one person is never going to work in exactly the same way or maybe to the same effect for another. Yeah, it's true. It's really, it's really true. But I think it, there has to be a certain will to wanting it to work and, um, being open to a variety of things. Um, and ultimately when someone gives us advice, sometimes even if we don't want to hear it, especially if if we are in the throes of, of something like a, a really deep depression, there's evidence of sort of this inability to even accept a, d a way of changing because the brain is so used to functioning in a certain way, following certain pathways. And so to carve out new ones is, is incredibly difficult. So it's, it's um, it's not just that we're grumpy and we don't want to hear it. It's that, that it's actually, you know, physically, it's, it's something that has has changed in us, and it, it takes a lot to, to sort of retrain our minds to to really listen to things like that. But I think I'll, I, I'm sort of looking at it as people really try their hardest and and uh, to give good advice, whether or not it, it is. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm sort of touched by by people's innate desire to help each other heal whether or not they succeed is is not really what i'm thinking about in that in that song it's just sort of people trying to just relate to one another <laughs>